Welcome everybody. Good evening. Um, welcome to the last of this uh, series of social policy seminars. I'm Rebecca Sarenda. I'm a senior research fellow at the department. I'll be chairing this evening's event. Um, it's really fabulous to see so many people have uh, signed up for the session uh, at the end of a, a, a very long term. So that's fabulous. And it's a clear testament to um, not only the importance of the topic that we're going to be discussing tonight, but also the convening power, if I can put it like that, the popularity of um, our speaker tonight, Professor Ian Goff. Um, Ian is known personally to many of us here, uh, and his work and publications will be known to many more of us. Um, I'll just say a few words about Ian before handing over uh, to him. He's a visiting professor in CASE, Centre for the Analysis of Social Exclusion, and an associate of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment, both, of course, um, part of the LSE. He's also an emeritus professor at the University of Bath, where he held the chair in social policy between 95 and 2009. His publications are far too numerous. We'd use up the whole time if I were to list them all, um, but they certainly include several seminal texts. Um, such as the political economy of the welfare state, a theory of human need, global capital, human needs and social policies, insecurity and welfare regimes in Asia, Africa and Latin America. Um, and his latest book is titled Heat, Greed and Human Need, Climate Change, Capitalism and Sustainable Wellbeing and was published in October 2017. It's a long title, Ian. Um, not only is Ian a prolific contributor to the literature and the debates within the subject, he is also a consummate horizon scanner, if I can put it like that, um, always looking to what our subject should be engaging with and perhaps isn't yet, um, how we should be thinking more innovatively or adapting our analytic frameworks. And long before social policy theorists and social policy analysis was interested in the dynamics of welfare and social protection in the global south, um, Ian began addressing these issues. And those of us working in this area are extremely indebted to his pioneering work. Similarly, Ian has been ahead of the curve in interrogating the impact and the implications of climate change on social policy. And that's, of course, the subject of tonight's seminar, and we're delighted to um, have him with us. So, Ian, um, a really big welcome from Oxford Social Policy, uh, and we're delighted to have you with us, and we'll hand over to you. And as Marek said, if colleagues could just turn off their cameras just while Ian's speaking, that would be great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, okay, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction, Rebecca, and it's very good to be with you. Well, I'm not with you, but I'd rather <laughs> be with you. <laughs> um, it's so annoying, but uh, uh, this is the best, and Zoom is a pretty uh, amazing um, invention. So, okay, the talk today is the myopia of social policy. It's basically climate change. And I'm going to press straight on. How do I do this? Um, how do I move from one to the other? Probably with your um, mouse at the bottom, you have those arrows. Got it. Yes, yes. So climate change is one aspect of this whole uh, geological new period we're in, the Anthropocene. <clears throat> when the, the period now that human activity is having a significant impact on the planet's geology, climate, ecosystems, and of course us, because we're part of the ecosystem. Um, so that, that's the setting. Welfare states, um, this is my one sentence to the definition, the redistribution of resources, incomes and services to achieve more equitable and humane social outcomes. Um, and I said, the, the issue I want to talk about is that uh, in talking about the second, we have to situate it in the light of the first, the, the Anthropocene, and in particular of uh, climate change. So um, here's, the, uh, here's the global heating, the rising temperatures over the last century or so, 
anything which is yellow or orange or red there is a rising temperature and um, the, the increase has been remarkable over the last 10 15 years and especially the incredible warming of the arctic zone which is very notable um, average global land temperatures now i'm just, just going to put a few facts and figures here 1.1 degree above the 19th century level the safe zone now agreed seems to be around 1.5 degrees so we're more than th two two thirds of the way there at present but if we carry on as at present, the current projections are something like a three degree uh, increase in global warming by the end of the century, which would be uh, utterly destructive. So the IPCC warns of severe, pervasive and irreversible impacts for people and ecosystems. And each of those three words are very significant. Um, to give you an idea of the, 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 the dilemmas caused by <coughs> um, inequality in the world, the available carbon budget the IPCC reckons, and you see this is the sort of issue we're talking about, the 66% chance of remaining below 1.5 degrees um, is 420 billion tonnes of carbon equivalent. Um, if you look at, that would mean the UK pro rata share of that budget would be about 3 billion tonnes for good. But our current UK consumption based emissions are about 600 million tonnes. So divide 3 billion by 600 million you get five years. We could only have five years of our current emissions if we were until we started exhausting our fair share of the carbon budget of the of the planet. So inequality and sustainability are inextricably linked. Um, and this is the background for thinking about social policy and climate change, and especially for rethinking welfare states in the rich countries. And um, that's the only thing I'm talking about today. I'm only talking about the rich countries. I'm not talking about uh, issues in the developing world, and I'm not speaking about um, global issues of equity and uh, climate and emissions. Um, I could answer questions on that, but uh, there's so much to talk about anyway. So let's start with Kate Rowers Donut. I assume you all know this, perhaps you don't. Uh, this is a very, I think, a vivid way of expressing the issues. <clears throat> on the outside, we have the, the ecological planetary boundaries um, identified by the Stockholm Institute, and there's nine of those. And there is nine, that's the important thing. I'm only talking about the top one there, climate change. But there's ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, fresh water shortages and so forth. So um, th those are the boundaries which should not be um, broken. And then on the inner ring, we have the social foundations, um, the basic needs and the basic institutions and arrangements which would permit uh, a decent standard of living for all people on the planet. And so uh, she, she, what, what's required is for us to remain in the safe and just space for humanity, as she describes it. I think there's still a vivid and useful way of thinking about things. Um, now, some friends at uh, Lilly, the Lilly Institute at uh, the University of Leeds, have undertaken a massive amount of calculation to, to calculate where different countries are using Kate Roweth's donut. And um, this, this diagram of theirs shows three, two big countries and the EU 28 members. Um, and it's to illustrate the different sort of routes that must be taken towards this safe and just um, place for humanity. The, the horizontal bound, uh, boundary here um, measures the biophysical boundaries that are transgressed, um, up to seven of those which were listed. And the social thresholds on the y-axis illustrate the, um, the, 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 um, the meeting of needs in different countries. So you can see India um, has a, a very low social foundation, many unmet needs, 
uh, but a relatively uh, good record in terms of um, planetary and sustainability. China is, is somewhere in between um, quite a large number of um, ecological boundaries transgressed um, and a, a higher social threshold. And the EU is at the top corner, uh, much better social standards, um, but five of the boundaries are illustrated there being transgressed at the present time. So um, the safe and just space is in the top left hand corner, clearly, uh, and it's there that we must head. But this is just to illustrate that the routes towards that space are very different across different parts of the world. And so, as I say, I'm only talking here about the rich countries, uh, including us. <clears throat> so this is the book um, and uh, that came out, good Lord, nearly three and a half years ago now. And this is the, um, the, the basic argument in this book. I, I, I argue that there's, you can distinguish three sort of meta stages of decarbonisation, of moving towards the safe space in rich countries. Um, the first is green growth, to decouple emissions from output. So you carry on with output, and most of these assume that it's growing through time, it's green growth. But you can achieve that with a massive decoupling of um, emissions uh, per unit of output. Um, I say that won't be enough. That's essential, but it won't be enough. The second meta strategy, if you like, is to recompose consumption in the rich countries. We must start thinking about what do we consume. And the third is degrowth. We must actually reduce the total amount of consumption in the, in the rich world. The second is about recomposing it in different ways. The third is about cutting the overall level. And I'm only going to look here at uh, the, the first two strategies. And I'm only looking at climate change, as I said, and I'm only looking at the rich world. But you can have that decarbonisation doesn't necessarily uh, mean fairness or justice. We need a just transition. We need fair decarbonisation, and this is the case for what I call eco-social policy, which links the two. It's for ethical and uh, justice reasons, and it's also, the second bullet point there, uh, for political pragmatic reasons. Without fairness, there is little or no chance of securing democratic consents, consent on the tremendous changes that need to take place in the next two decades or so. So to modify those three, we need fair eco-efficiency, ensuring that climate mitigation policies don't penalise the vulnerable groups or worsen distribution. At the very least, we mustn't make things worse. We need fair recomposition of consumption, which means pursuing a consumption corridor between minimum and maximum consumption standards, drawing here on the distinction between necessities and luxuries, which I'll return to. And fair degrowth would ensure that the biophysical case for degrowth is not implemented at the expense of the ethico-social case, as uh, Daly argues. Um, so that's the, that's the framework. We, and I want to look at these two things here. How do we achieve fair eco-efficiency? How do we achieve fair uh, recom recomposition of consumption? So the rest of the lectures is on those two uh, subjects. So I argue that um, the, the basic, my basic policy for fair eco-efficiency is a Green New Deal plus universal basic services. I'll start with the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is an integrated eco-social pro programme that enhances both welfare and sustainability. Um, it's a framework but with great national variations. Um, it's adhered to in the UK, the USA and the EU, or it's a general topic of conversation in both, in all those regions. But it means very different things. I mean, in the USA, um, access, uh, right to health care, which doesn't exist at the moment, is a sort of key feature of the Green New Deal. That's not necessary in the sense in the UK and the EU. So uh, 
All proposals recognise synergies between climate and welfare, and I could spend a long time talking about these, but um, just to say that they're not necessarily in conflict, far from it. Employment um, is, is an issue, but there are pluses and minuses here. Clearly, um, workers in high carbon industries and oil and gas and so forth will diminish over time, but employment in other areas uh, will grow in, in, in engineering, in building and so forth. Um, air pollution is, it was a case where um, re reducing reliance on uh, high carbon fuels will benefit both welfare and the climate. Energy poverty is another area. Nutrition is another area if uh, high meat diets are, are reduced as a part of um, a climate policy and sustainable livelihoods. So um, that's taken for granted. We could talk about that more if we wish. Um, I think it's true to say that Green New Deal proposals also recognise that carbon pricing is regressive. The basic answer which I encountered just 10 years or so ago, whenever talking to economists, just get the prices right, um, is will almost always be regressive. Because the big three essentials, as I show in chapter seven of my book, food, housing, transport, are basically carbon intensive areas of the economy. And so raising price, carbon prices will tend to price those um, necessities uh, higher. And also there's a belief, I think, that simple compensation, monetary compensation of, of losing households, is problematic and unsustainable. And I could talk more about that. But it's very difficult to compensate for the if effects of rising prices, even if we just look at food, housing and transport. Um, a feature of Green New Deal is that upfront investment is crucial. And here I can use the climate change report, which has just come out on the sixth carbon budget. The Committee on Climate Change is, is, is a wonderful store of information. Um, they estimate that it will require investment of about £50 billion a year per year for 30 years um, in order to achieve uh, as a net to zero um, economy by 2050, which is the goal of the of the UK government. Um, this is their estimate of the, um, the investment programme required uh, and you can see it, it's about 50 billion a year, um, which is about two and a half percent of GDP. But if we look at the, the colours at the bottom, the, the purple at the bottom is transport and the red and the orange is buildings. So transport and housing accounts for about one half of the investment that's needed. Um, for a net zero program. Um, and so this is a, a, a massive investment job. Retrofitting requires 20,000 dwellings to be retrofitted every week for 30 years. And uh, while some of that can be done through, um, through second mortgages and so forth for better off people, it will require a lot of public investment. Uh, and that's also required in transport as well. Uh, this leads then to a lot of interesting questions about how you fund this, the reform of fiscal frameworks, a green investment bank called for again by the Climate Change Committee, green quantitative easing, uh, and so on. I'm not going to talk about that, partly because I'm not really totally au fait with a lot of this discussion, but it, it does have major implications for um, a, a, green, a proper Green New Deal has major implications for the financial system. Um, now to turn to the social dimension. Uh, I think I would argue that increased public service provision is an essential part, a component of an effective Green New Deal. Public services which meet needs directly. Um, provision of in-kind, in-kind provision as opposed to providing income support and leaving, leaving the provisioning system to market forces, which is what I call the pure UBI system. Um, 
That will mean strengthening health and education, um, which are the two basic sectors of public service provision at present, but extending this to housing, social care, child care, water, energy, transport, and possibly other areas as well. Um, an essential feature of this is to provide entitlements to basic need satisfiers in, the, in these areas. Uh, and ensuring that these are, if not free, are at least at, at a subsidised cost where needed. Um, so here's a couple of examples. Social care much discussed at the present time. An entitlement to adequate, good quality, free or affordable social care. Models such as the Germany, German um, long-term care insurance and the Scottish scheme. Um, uh, I can't go into any details here, but um, this, is, this is much debated even within the Conservative Party at the present time. This is a direct in-kind service or low-cost service uh, uh, that's mooted here. Another totally different area is bus transport. We discuss uh, extending the current Freedom Pass to the entire population and estimating the amount of investment required for this and the amount of regulation which would be required to ensure that other cities enjoy the wonderful bus service system which we which we have in London but which exists really nowhere else in the country. So these would be examples of, um, of, of extending uh, free or affordable public service provision uh, in the UK. Um, now the case for this, I, I, I should argue that there's a, there's a couple of um, publications on this I should have meant, put, put a link to. I'll, I'll do that later on. The case for this can be equity, effectiveness, solidarity, sustainability. Uh, and um, there's, there's strong evidence that this is, uh, these, these results are quite um, substantial. Uh, let me look. Let me give some, a couple of uh, some data on each of these. This is the uh, equality argument. This is the OECD study, it's like 10 years old. I don't think it would change much. Looking at the value of in-kind benefits, in-kind benefits um, to different uh, quintiles in the income distribution across all 27 OECD countries. And you can see there that when you add up education, healthcare, social housing and care, uh, it's worth 76% to the lowest quintile, 14% to the highest. Any system of, of, of distributing free or low cost public services is immensely uh, redistributive. But I was surprised to find in recent study that uh, it's also um, more uh, climate friendly, at least insofar as this gives an indication of it. These are the health carbon footprints per capita um, of different countries uh, and what stands out here is is the much higher carbon footprint of the USA to all the European countries two and a half to three and a half times higher um, this is a result of, of, of I mean it's essentially a privatized system with a large number of uh, commercial providers big commercial interests and I think this illustrates how um, public provision can be more uh, effective at reducing the um, climate and environmental impact of social services. Um, going back, so the case is, is uh, certainly equity and sustainability. The UBS is, it would be a public policy framework, it would be disaggregated and government would, have a, would not be the only provider of these services. But the government would also play a big role in regulation, standard setting, taxation and subsidies. So my argument is that this ties in very well with the Green New Deal. Um, you, you know, UBS would, more public services would benefit the social foundations, in, in Kate Rao's donut, but also the ecological ceiling. And my argument is that the UBI alone will not do this. 
Giving people money to spend on goods and services to meet their needs is potentially a self-defeating route. We must reform the delivery of the services. We, have a very, we spend a lot of money on housing benefit in, in the UK, which goes up year by year because the housing system is, is not reformed. And of course, the rise in health costs in the US are, are, are legendary. Um, it does, UBI does nothing directly to decarbonize the economy. We must in re reform and improve income transfers, but towards guaranteeing a decent basic income, not paying it out to everyone. So I would argue there's a, there's a case here, and we've, we're developing this, for a social guarantee that encompasses both money and in-kind services. I'm watching the time as I go along. Okay, I think that's the first part of the, the I talk. Now I turn to the second part, uh, recomposing consumption. Can we move to a post-materialist welfare state? Um, I've talked about so far about eco-efficiency and the Green New Deal. Um, and they are essential, but they will not be e enough. Some scenario planning in Sweden illustrates this. I use this in the book um, just to get this over this is um, just um, greenhouse gas emissions from Sweden over the next um, over a 40 year period um, if you carry on with the technology of today they shoot up and up uh, if you assume that the eco efficiency will improve continue to improve at historic rates uh, you'll get the red line that's quite a strong assumption because the low hanging fruit would have been picked already. And if we double the yearly echo efficiency rate, we'll get the blue line. But it's still not enough to get down to the emissions required for a two degree uh, target, let alone a 1.5 degree target, which would be quite a bit lower than that green uh, box. And so to get to those, we, um, the argument of the of Larson and Nassen here is that we must get to, we must start, we must add to Green New Deal a post-material scenario. Um, and this is also necessary because uh, we are assuming con green, a green growth assumes continuing growth and doesn't tackle luxuries and inequity and non-generalizability. The notion that we cannot generalize the income standards which we enjoy in the West to 8 billion people across the world. Um, I mean, the story of SUVs is very interesting here. Um, it is an extraordinary growth of SUVs, which have cancelled out all the improvements in car efficiency um, over the last 10 years or so, um, so that emissions from, uh, from car transport continue to increase um, because there's been a shift towards much larger and gas guzzling cars and the world bank's estimate is that uh, if american suv drivers switched to standard european cars the emissions saved would, would enable everyone in the world to have access to a modest amount of electricity within the same emissions framework so these are big big uh, issues here we can't um, carry on with uh, a consumption lifestyle in the west uh, which we've enjoyed in the past. We must recompose consumption, reduce consumption emissions by switching from high to low, low carbon goods and services. Um, and what's interesting, this is a bit of a digression, is that climate science is now recognizing the role of recomposing demand. In all the, um, the scenarios and modeling that goes on about uh, global emissions, the emphasis has been on uh, technological change, rapid technological shifts, in order to get this decoupling underway, coupled with pricing and so forth. Um, but the IPCC, as far as I read it now, is recognising that alongside these, we need demand side policies to, um, to in, or, in order to achieve um, two, two degrees, let alone 1.5. For example, there's quite a lot of discussion now about the ISA framework, which stands for Improve, Shift, Avoid. 
which has been developed when, by transport planners. The improved part here would refer to um, introducing electric vehicles and charging systems to uh, improve the uh, echo efficiency of, of, of cars. The shift would, been, um, would, would go up one stage, moving away from car transport altogether to active uh, transport or public transit. And the avoid would go one further than that, involving shifts in urban planning uh, to, uh, or, and other shifts to increase home working, for example, or in, increase internet shopping. Um, and at these, each of these sta stages, you can um, estimate a very substantial uh, carbon savings. Uh, and the climate scientists are now recognising that these uh, approaches can be effective and they avoid that risk of um, high-risk technologies such as um, bioengineering and carbon uh, uh, saving, which is, uh, which is still basically an untested technology. And at the same time, these would lead to improvements in well-being, for example, more active uh, travel. And this framework can also be applied to the other two big areas I've talked about, which is food and housing. I won't go into that now. So, um, but so we need this, these um, demand side policies, um, but this must also be just um, and must be fair. More collective consumption, the UBS approach, will help here, but this still leaves highly unequal private consumption. Um, and this I think this must mean tackling high carbon luxuries. So the upshot of this for me is that fair recomposition of consumption means discussing limits or ceilings. Uh, as well as flaws, we have to start thinking about what is an excessive amount of income and consumption. Um, and Professor Stewart, the Oxford Institute many years ago argued it's not equitable to ask some people to surrender necessities so that other people can retain luxuries. And Ingrid Robbins has in recent years developed the idea of limitarianism. It is not permissible to have more resources than are needed to fully flourish in, in life. And others uh, in Switzerland and um, Germany and elsewhere have developed the idea of a consumption corridor between a floor of uh, acceptable consumption for a necessary uh, and decent lifestyle, but also a ceiling to this uh, corridor. Um, well, is this pie in the sky? I mean, how, can any of this be achieved in a democratic welfare state? How can we distinguish need satisfiers, my term, um, from the human need theory, and luxuries? in a democratic society. Our argument in the, in the book, in the last chapter of um, uh, my book with Len Doyle uh, on a theory of human need, um, approaches this question. A lot of the book is about need, about human needs and universal human needs. But there's a sharp distinction throughout between needs and need satisfiers. Need satisfiers are rarely universal. They differ immensely across different cultures and times um, and countries and locations and will have to be negotiated separately. To do this we advocate in the last chapter a deal strategy, a dialogic democracy which brings together citizens and experts to negotiate these um, what are acceptable need satisfiers. Uh, and um, citizens forums uh, have been argued uh, have been advocated to do this. Citizens forums that are inclusive and empowering and will enable this sort of di dialogue to take place. But this all seemed to be rather up in the air until last year when citizens assemblies uh, were set up on fair decarbonisation in both the UK and in France. Um, and these require more publicity than they've, they've got. I'm going to speak about the one in France because this was um, because in this in France, uh, President Macron actually made a commitment that all the recommendations of the French Citizens Assembly 
would be implemented by his government. Um, the citizens assemblies are also growing now um, at local and regional levels. I've just heard that there's one to be set up, the Yorks and Humber, Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission is going to be set up soon. Um, when we look at the, the, the French Citizens Convention, as it's called, um, it's 150 randomly selected but representative citizens meeting for nine months and advised by a whole slew of experts. This is not a short term, simple and cheap thing. It takes a lot of resources to do this. Um, the convention was tasked to decide policies to achieve a 40% cut in France's greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. That was their goal. Uh, and uh, the convention ultimately agreed on 149 proposals, including such things as fast mandatory retrofit of the least energy efficient buildings by 2030, a ban on high emission vehicles as early as 2025. Various um, deadlines were put forward by the experts 2035, uh, 2030, but the, the convention decided that they should be banned by 2025. Mandatory labels in retail and consumer places and advertisements on the greenhouse gas com composition of all goods and services and limiting the use of heating and air conditioning in all, in all buildings. Those were just a few that I've selected. And it's interesting that these were consensual, um, this was, uh, were, were consensual decisions uh, and that a good number of the, of the citizens in the assembly to begin with were um, uh, sceptical about climate change and uh, uh, from some outright deniers. So uh, it is interesting, in my view, the way that uh, this can, I think, find a way of getting some agreement on some of these difficult issues. And then uh, another, and I'm coming to the end now, um, indication of this in the COVID crisis was the government's list of essential workers. All, uh, a year ago, almost a year ago to the day, the UK government provided a list of all the essential workers in the country um, because they, children of these workers would be entitled to continued schooling during the lockdown. And this was the way of defining those children which would get this schooling. The, the government list uh, went way beyond health and social care and the emergency services, which we would have expected. It included farmers, supermarket staff, workers in the utilities, teachers, telecommunication workers, transport staff, workers in law and justice, religious, religious staff and social security and retail banking staff. So there was some notion here of the list of um, occupations and work that needed to be done to keep the economy going uh, in this in this crisis period. And I was fascinated myself to compare this to the um, reserved occupations which were um, announced uh, shortly before the Second World War in, in Britain um, and the similarities and differences between those lists. Other countries have also uh, made similar lists. It'd be interesting to compare those. So, um, and this to me is uh, is, is sort of uh, rad very radical for two reasons. First of all, identifying key workers flouts uh, neoclassical value theory, which says that any one, any work which is priced, uh, is is productive. Um, it, it's sort of it's flouting the indifference rule. It's saying that certain workers are productive with the implication that other workers may be less productive or even unproductive. And the second um, sort of radical implication is the discovery that key workers are paid less on average than, than general workers. The um, IFS has, has provides the information on this. And indeed that some many key workers are paid a very low wages on um, close to the minimum income standard. So um, there's a dramatic gap between market valuation and social or normative valuation. Um, can this, can this uh, 
recognition of the social valuation of work uh, be developed? This is a, a question. So uh, my conclusion to this part of the talk is, is, is to a question. Can social policy embrace flaws and ceilings? And um, I, I, I would argue that uh, to do this, we need a human needs theory, an alternative theory, value theory, to the standard one based on consumer preferences. Um, and I think using that, we can identify ceilings as well as flaws. And, and this is a, a diagram which it would be fascinating to fill out. Um, I've mentioned the flaws of essential labour. And the other two areas of here, which consumption and income and wealth, um, social policy has done a lot of work here to identify what are necessities in any particular context in current Britain and what are acceptable minimum incomes in current Britain. So there's, plenty, there's a lot of work and experience on the flaws. Can we start to think um, creatively but consensually about uh, ceilings, about inessential labour. There's quite a lot of uh, writing on uh, socially unproductive labour, guard labour, bullshit jobs, to quote the late David Graeber, um, which we could follow up. In consumption, the, we, we can start thinking about luxuries which are not generalisable uh, to the rest of the population. And in income and wealth, we can follow uh, uh, Ingrid Robbins, uh, and um, we've undertaken some research ourselves to see if, if focus groups of people in communities could identify uh, a riches level, um, which uh, is, is more than enough, if you like. Is there an income which is more than enough, which is beyond prosperity, beyond flourishing or plenitude, um, about which is uh, excessive. I could talk more about that if, if people are interested. Um, so I'm just going to conclude with, uh, with this one final slide. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that I've, I've missed out a huge amount in, in this talk. Uh, for example, food policy and agricultural policy when we start to think about the ways in which social policy interacts with environmental policy, it's a very, very big field. But um, I, I would argue that, that there are four key proposals for an eco-social policy that takes the ecological crisis seriously. First of all, develop a Green New Deal as an essential framework for a just decarbonisation. Secondly, extend collective consumption, uh, the notion of universal basic services, can combine this with uh, a, a, an acceptable minimum income level as in, in the form of a social guarantee which recognises cash and in-kind benefits. Income is always a mixture of those two things. Thirdly, develop measures to restrain unsustainable private consumption. And I think citizens' assemblies can help us here but I've not talked much about what this might involve. And then fourthly, protect essential workers and revalue labour. And with that, I'm going to stop. Ian, thank you very much. Um, I'm also just struggling with my uh, getting the technology right. Um, thank you so much for that clear and provocative um, introduction to this discussion. Uh, as you say, it's absolutely a, a, a huge topic with many moving parts. And we have a large number of people in the seminar this evening. As I said, it's a, a real reflection of how how important this topic is to people and how much people want to hear your thoughts about it. Um, and you're going to get a lot of questions and comments uh, and discussion, I'm sure. Can